So today we have Neil Lambert tell us about non-abelian quotients, Calabiaus, and 5DS fold CFTs. Take it away. Thank you very much. Uh, so I'd like to thank Julius and everybody for the invitation. And uh, it's a, hopefully going to be fun and uh, informative. I also sort of want a disclaimer. I apologize because I feel like, uh, well, there's a saying in England about uh, bringing coals to Newcastle. And I, I, I feel like uh, everybody in the audience is going to be more of an expert than I am on this topic. Uh, so uh, I hope that I still have something to, to share. So this is indeed a, a project that came out, well, I guess last October, November, uh, with these collaborators of Bobby Acharya, Marwan Naya, Eric Spanners, and Jiha Tian. Um, and also I want to highlight here two other papers which have appeared since, one by uh, Jiha Tian and her collaborator Wang. And I think actually he spoke about this uh, on this journal club we were meeting uh, a few weeks ago. And then there's also another paper which develops what we were talking about by uh, the Korean group. So I'll highlight those here. So um, let's start from the very beginning. What am I gonna be talking about? So I will do an, an introduction. It's perhaps a bit moot, such a specialized journal club, but who knows who's there? Maybe somebody uh, wants to know my motivations. Uh, so there's a section also, which is perhaps a bit of a review, which is how you get from toric calabiaus to PQ refs. Um, and then we start with the, the new eye work, which is uh, these non abelian quotients and their interpretation in PQ five brain webs as S folds. And then I'll have some sections on testing our ideas. So uh, there's a cyber Witten curve, the construction of the cyber Witten curve for these theories, and also uh, a little bit perhaps on constructing uh, the uh, singular Calabiao as a, as a hypersurface in C4. And then a, a very few uh, comments and conclusions. So for me, at least, and probably other people, one of the most surprising results to come out of string theory and M theory is the existence of non-gravitational superconformal field theories with two interesting features. Um, one, above four dimensions. So that was a, a real surprise. Um, and uh, because it goes against sort of any sort of textbook understanding that I was certainly taught when I was a graduate student. And uh, I often say that, that this is, I view this as a prediction of string and M theory, something that you can go and then you can try to construct and you can convince your colleagues for condensed matter or particle physics or collider physics or anything like that, um, that these things actually exist. And the other one is that, is that they can have exceptional global symmetries. Uh, I think the first example was Menahan and Chansky. Uh, and especially, well, these two together uh, hint or tell us that really these things are not Lagrangian. Uh, they don't have any classical Lagrangian um, uh, description to them. Uh, in a traditional sense, if, if you were, uh, I've spent quite a lot of time trying to do an untraditional sense in which you can construct a Lagrangian for at least six dimensional field theories, performance field theories, but that's another story. And I'm the first to admit that it's certainly not uh, a classic construction. Like you write down some Lagrangian that's your Lorentz invariant and uh, do perturbation theory in any sense. But having said that, you know, these uh, conformal field theories, which if you speak to a conformal field theorist colleague, um, they're just about a bunch of data. They're a list of operators, a list of conformal dimensions, and uh, uh, three point functions, in which, since they don't really depend on anything, they're just like a list of numbers. So I sometimes refer to these things as, a, as, as like a telephone directory. Uh, it don't, a priori, it might not seem very interesting because there's just a list of numbers for your operators. Having said that, of course, they are very interesting, um, and not least of all because they do have profound relationship to gauge theories through a variety of methods. So we think of these things as gauge theories, even though in some sense, when you say the word gauge, <laughs> that's like a Lagrangian term itself, right? I mean, you're imagining that there's a connection and uh, the hence is a derivative and that's active on something, it's not gauging well. So um, I don't need to say this audience that there is just an enormous and bewildering zoo of such theories in five, well, any dimension, five and six and four. Uh, and they play a, a really important role. They're interesting in their own right because of these challenges, um, but they also play 
uh, to me, uh, an important role in trying to understand what the microscopic degrees of freedom are in things like string theory and M theory. So I've been very naughty here and I've just referenced everybody on the top um, and on the mailing list simply because I knew I would offend somebody if I put a finite list here, at least one that, that, that fits easily on the screen. And in this way, I've either offended nobody or everybody. And I feel that's much more symmetric. Uh, but I think everybody knows that there's been a great deal of work done by uh, various groups um, throughout the world. Uh, so you know who you are and I apologize. Um, so how do we get these theories? Well, one is two M5 frames or M5 frames of singularities or M5 frames wrapped on various manifolds with or without singularities. Another is through uh, deep Chapman limits of F theory. Uh, and the third is what we're gonna be talking about today is M theory on the non-compact singular calendar. Okay. So let us remind ourselves of the basics, why are we interested in doing it like this? So uh, without any space-time singularities or explicitly putting brains into M theory, uh, the low energy effective action is just a free abelian theory coupled to gravity. Okay? Not generally considered to be a particularly interesting system. However, a well-known way to introduce singularities is via an asymptotically conical complete Calvi-Yau called X. So you split your space-time, 11 dimensional space-time into a five-dimensional Lorentzian bit, and then the seven-dimensional bit, but it's not compact. Uh, and so one takes it to have this asymptotically um, conical form, or in fact, you'll take it to be completely conical. Um, so gravity decouples because you send M Planck like the volume to infinity. But the idea is that there's these little things that are stuck at the singularity, and those are interacting degrees of freedom that are arising from various states that might be localized to that singularity. And of course, for a variety of reasons, we think this is a, a conformal field theory, in particular here, it's a five dimensional conformal field theory. So the game that everyone I think is familiar with is you want to try to reveal what this degree of freedom are, what, what's going on. And the key idea there is actually, is you resolve the singularity singularity somehow. So you take this, this X singular uh, orbifold and you try to resolve it into X tilde, which is a smooth calorie half. So the key of this is after the re resolution, sorry, I was going to say revolution, after the resolution, um, what happens? Well, this is a well-known dictionary. So if you have compact force like this in your calorie half, X tilde, those are going to give you Poincaré normalizable two forms and then standard uh, supergravity uh, dimensional reduction tells you that each of those is going to give you U1 vector. Um, the non compact four cycles, well, they would give you vector fields, but their kinetic terms are infinite. So basically, you just get the symmetry. So they give rise to flavor U1s. Um, and then, if you want to actually get states, well, uh, apart from the, the photon nodes from the gravity multiplet. Uh, you wrap M2 brains, of course, when the cycles collapse, they become massless. Um, and so uh, wrapping on compact two cycles gives you states which become massless and are charged under the various U1s that you got from the non-compact four cycles, from the, from the compact four cycles. And then uh, other information is the triple and section numbers which lead to this cubic term in the, in the 5 dp potential of uh, the flow energy effective theory of gate theory. So again, uh, this is an abelian theory, um, but it's now reinterpreted differently. It's interpreted as the effective theory on the Coulomb branch of the superconformal field theory that's been stuck at this fixed point. And the name of the game, which everyone here has been deeply involved in, is to match all this data up. Uh, the data of the non-abelian superconformal field theory and the geometric data that's associated with the Calvi-Yau and how all these things match in terms of gauge groups, flavor groups, and these days, uh, one form symmetry, et cetera. And of course, this can be arbitrarily hard. Um, and of course, a buzzword for everyone here is this the McKay correspondence, which, which translates in purely group theoretic data about the overflow into the uh, gauge group and flavor group information. OK. So we're still on a bit of a review, review here. That was the motivation, the, the, the setting. Uh, so let's talk about uh, 
the most basic thing which was done years ago by many authors again. Uh, but uh, profoundly by uh, Afoni, uh, Ko and uh, Anane, and then also a Lung and Fafa paper, which is this story about how you go from uh, a toric carabial, this type, the gamma is an abelian subgroup, um, and then you can map it in a very beautiful way to a PQ web diagram. Okay? This has been profoundly useful uh, by many authors over the years. Um, so again, you take a very specific choice, and uh, while I've been in, in Cairo for the last uh, two years, three years even, and uh, everywhere I go is this Islamic architecture, and Islamic architecture is full of Toric PQ webs. And P, uh, P, sorry, Toric diagrams and PQ webs. So this is actually the ceiling of some palace somewhere in Cairo. And as you can see, if you're you know, walking around as a theoretical physicist tourist, um, you will see this beautiful ceiling. And of course, you will immediately think that you can draw your toric diagram on it uh, by putting the, the big stars as the vertices. So this is the, you can interpret this as a toric diagram, uh, fully resolved, of course. Uh, and the name of the game for the PQ web story is, of course, you construct the dual diagram, which you do there in red. You see it fits very nicely onto this beautiful ceiling. And then to get to the PQ web, you remove the toric diagram and you're just left with this five brain web construction. And if you want, if you have these five brains that are stretching up to infinity, you chop them off and you let them end on uh, seven brains. So PQ five brain can end on a PQ seven brain. And of course, I think you all know uh, this might be a D five brain. Uh, well, I've written it kind of funny. This would be a, a one one brain and this would be a uh, NS five brain. We'll come back to that short in a bit. But this is uh, meant to be a nice illustration of how you get from the toric creator to um, uh, the five brain web diagram. And this has been studied by many authors in many beautiful papers explaining how the gauge three information can be read out by fooling around, playing around with uh, the, the diagram, reading our flavor groups, etc. So you probably would recognize that the example I wrote down corresponds to the so-called TN theories. Uh, so it turns out that the gamma there is Zn plus Zn. So it's an orthofold, it's an abelian orthofold. And the associated five pieces of form field theories are these uh, TN theories by Benini, Benveniti, Tashikawa. Uh, and naively at least, if you read it off from the Torah data, you're going to get gauge and flavor groups as such. So it's SUN minus one all the way down to SU2. And then there's a, a triple SUN flavor selectivity. But of course, as everybody in this seminar will know, that one of the most amusing things about this game is that suddenly sometimes it's, it's symmetries are bigger and, or an exception. And for example, here you can come up with an E6 theory rather than uh, just ordinary SUNs. Okay, so what, what have we been doing? So uh, what we can say is we can notice that this, this, this ceiling, if someone, if it was an infinite ceiling at least, and it's unfortunately not an infinite ceiling, uh, it, it has a Z3 symmetry where you can rotate around these red points, red lines that I've said. And of course, if you do that, uh, it's a special point of the origin, which I put in blue, and we're gonna see that that's gonna correspond to uh, putting in a seven brain. Into the diagram. So this leads to uh, a toric resolution, which is going to be Z3 symmetric. We're going to be looking for toric resolutions, which are Z2 symmetric. So I've put the whole thing here without the fancy ceiling in the way. Um, for n plus three and n plus four, I think people will be familiar with these diagrams. Of course, they're usually written as a square, more, more rectilinear, like I did. But here they're written to show this, the Z3 rotational symmetry. So of course, uh, the blue lines represent the resolution. Um, and it's important that you resolve it in a Z3 symmetric way. Of course, there are many ways to resolve the, this toric diagram leading to different smooth calibrials, but we have to take the one Z3 symmetric. And that's what these blue triangulations represent. And then the green lines are the dual uh, diagram, the dual lattice. And that's 
where you read off the P Q five framework web. Um, and then uh, the red lines represent uh, the rotational symmetry that we're going to be imposing, right? Because now you can demand that your resolution has this symmetry and then you can overfold out by it as well. And that leads to uh, what is known as the delta three n squared overfold. So we're looking at C3 mod delta three n squared and delta three n squared is Z3 semi-direct product with Zn times Zn. So in particular, the generators would be the following, M1, M2, and then this is the Z3 guy that, that commutes the action on the coordinates. Um, this is just a very special case. It's the case we looked at. Uh, it's just one of about 12 classes of uh, subgroups that are classified at SU3. And in principle, you can think about all of these, what, what kind of caliber AL they give, what kind of resolutions they give, what data they come with, um, what's their age groups and their uh, flavor groups. And this is known by the mathematical work, um, but Ito and Reed primarily, but then they've also been studied from a physics perspective quite detailed by these authors relatively recently in, in the last three, four months. Um, but I'm just going to be concentrating on this case here today, because that's what we did. Uh, and also, there was a recent paper by Kim Jong Lee, which is the one I mentioned on the, the front page, where they consider a, a wider class, much wider class of this kind of rotational symmetry. So the idea is that you have this set three that's come in, in this case, it's coming simply out of classification of, of uh, subgroups of SU3. But uh, we're, we've motivated it and derived it as actually really in some sense a physical rotation in space time in the, in the PQ Python web space. Um, but you can consider more than Z trees and they consider ZNs and various uh, interesting varying web diagrams which have a, a, some kind of rotational symmetry in them. Okay. Um, so for such calories it's known uh, how you can compute the information you need to know to make some guesswork. There's still a little guesswork, of course, in uh, what the gauge theory data, what the estimated perform field theory data is. And it all boils down to this thing that I call the uh, age function, which is you take your G in your gamma and you diagonalize it. So you can write it like uh, this. And then you have this notion of an age, so an appropriate language these days. But we call it the age of the gauge group and it's just the sum of you see and actually it's relatively elementary to to see that the age is either zero one or two um and in fact what the sorry and the ages are, are to be well sorry so that's the age of an element and then you want to know uh, about the size of the conjugal classes associated to elements of various ages now age zero is the identity um but it's so it's one and two that are doing all the heavy lifting for you so in particular, the result of these authors from a while back is that the number of exception, total number of exceptional devices is the size of gamma one, and uh, the total number of compact devices is gamma two, size of gamma two, and therefore you can read off the rank of the gauge group uh, and the rank of the flavor group. So of course, so the rank of the gauge group is, is the compact uh, four cycles, compact divisors, and the rank of the flavor group is what's that. Neil? Yeah. Is there a gauge theory deformation of this theory? A, a gauge theory? Yeah. Gauge theory deformation? Yeah, so I mean, not, not all 5D theories have gauge theory deformations. Yes, so exactly. I'm assuming here that in our case, yes, I think it does. But in general, yeah, they may not be a G. <laughs> Is that what you mean? Well, I mean, that's the, that's the rank of the Coulomb, that's the dimension of the Coulomb branch, I guess. but. Yeah. It, do you have an explicit gauge theory deformation of this resulting theory? What, what do you mean by deformation? What is the IR? Is there an IR gauge theory description? In terms of this usual on the Coulomb branch? Like with the no, no. I mean, so the TN theory has a gauge theory description in the IR, S U N minus one times S U N minus two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That. Yeah. So so after you do this projection, is there 
Yeah, I see your question. Um, I, we ha I don't know, actually, to be honest, I don't have a clear gauge theory interpretation of in general. Um, yeah, I mean, only one of the SUNs is visible among the three SUNs. That's the global symmetry. I was asking about whether there's a gauge theory, this Lagrangian description. Yeah. Whether yeah. there's a mass deformation of this theory that is described by a... No, I, I'm saying that if you go on to this, this Lagrangian description, it's clear that there is no Z3 symmetry while preserving the Lagrangian description. So at least not this one, the standard one. By the standard one, you mean the one for the TN theory? Yes. Right, this is not the TN theory. This is a new theory. Yeah. It's a Z3 gauging of TN theory. Yeah. Z3 zero form gauging of it. Yeah. yeah. And in, well, as we will discuss later, it's just this, there's a particular two different cases, and I would expect that one case might well have a gauge theory description, but the other one probably wouldn't. I don't, as we'll see shortly. That would be my, would be my immediate guess. Um, yeah. Okay. So this is just a slide to show you that we computed something. So that's what you get explicitly for uh, delta three n. These are the sizes. And as you can see here, that there, and what will happen continuously is that there's a choice, a difference between whether n is a multiple of three or not. That's a big difference qualitatively in all everything that I have said. Okay. So the key idea we have is that we're going to start with the Z3 symmetric TN brain web uh, and uh, make this identification under the Z3. So we're doing the rotation. In space, of, well, if you think about the toric data, you, you, you've got a Z3 symmetric resolution of the toric data. And then in the brain web side, you're actually thinking of taking the brain web and, and, and uh, rotating it and making identification of the rotation by two pi by three. So certainly you're going to find that uh, the flavor group is going to be reduced. You had three flavor groups coming from each of the, uh, well, there's this picture here coming from each of the sides, if you like, from this side, that side, or that side. And here this is SU4. Uh, um, they're gonna be rotated into, they're gonna be identified. So you certainly would expect that the flavor group is just reduced to SUN. But if we look at that information that we get from the um, Ito Reed paper, we can compute the flavor group, right? And it is, well, one of these two possibilities, and that's always bigger than SUN. So uh, we get a bigger flavor symmetry than we were entitled to get, so to speak. And if we look at the rank of the gauge group, uh, well, it's always smaller than the rank of the TN gauge group, which would be something like a half n, what's well, a half n, n, n minus one, n minus two. Uh, and this is one six n squared. Uh, so it's, and that's of course not surprising that we've reduced some gauge group, some gauge group, but you've increased, uh, your flavor group compared to what you would naively expect. So uh, in type 2b, the identification corresponds to introducing a seven brain at the origin because you, well, when we think about it, you've introduced a conical deficit. And it's going to have this slot on it. This is uh, NQ is the ident identity. And if you go back, to these 90s and something when this has worked out, this, this kind of uh, seven brain corresponds to an E6 flavor symmetry. Um, and uh, the key thing that this distinguishes between these two cases, the N equals 3K and N not 3K, uh, when you map to the five brain web diagram, it simply comes that at N equals 3K, there isn't a five brain at the origin. But for N, when N is not 3K, there is a five brain at the origin. So the sort of story we like to have is that there's an E6 that comes, E6, the global symmetry that comes, flavor symmetry that comes from the seven brain. Um, but if you put a five brain on it, you break it and you break it to SU3. If you don't put a five brain on it, it's gonna be there. And so the conjecture we would have then is for n equals 3K, the flavor group is SUN times E6, and of course, that agrees with this. But if n is not equal to 3k, 
it's SUN just times an SU3, and that of course agrees with this. Okay. And as we will see, and as is sort of part of the course in um, this game, is that you, you can actually have further enhancements. So let us look at n equals three. So here is the uh, brain web uh, for the T three theory, and uh, the, the color coding is meant to represent the brains that are identified under the spatial rotation. Okay. And then on the right hand side is a picture of what you might imagine you get in the overfolded theory, uh, this rather odd uh, looking brain construction. Perhaps the, the the dot there is just the origin. It doesn't, doesn't represent anything except the origin. <laughs> um, of course, you, you might worry why you have curved brains, but the point is that they're not really curved it's because you've introduced this deficit angle. One way to think about this is as if it's living on a cone. And actually these guys are looking down from the top of the cone. And these guys are just going, they're straight, but they're going around the cone. Okay. Well, does that Can remind you? Can you go back to this fiber at the origin? I didn't understand that. Ah, well, so okay, is that what you mean by this dot? No, so sorry, that's this dot actually represents the origin, but there's nothing there. So in th this is a case where there's no five brain at the origin. The origin is here, and none of the five brains touch it. So this this dot is perhaps a bit misleading. It's just telling you that, that that's where the origin is. There's nothing there. So, so the case where well, there's a seven brain. Sorry, there's a seven brain here now because I've introduced the top the deficit angle. So what would it look like, say, with the five minute origin? I don't know, for n equals to four, for example. Right? Yeah, that's the next slide. So. Okay. Sorry. so give me a second and then I will I'll show you. So this is n equals three case. The origin is here. There's no five brain. So when I do the smarting out, I introduce a seven brain, but it doesn't touch any of the five brains. They go around it, if you like. Um, yeah. So this is a rather weird looking brain diagram, but you can get something pretty close to it by another means, which is you start with an E8 web. So you, this fellow here, which I should say a priori has nothing to do with what we're talking about. It's just, you go into the literature and you find yourself an E8 brain web, rank one. Um, and then you just proceed by a series of Hanane Witten moves to try to get the seven brains inside. Yeah. So you, you, you cross over here and then you've got this red seven brain. And then you pull this one down here and that gives you the blue seven brain, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you keep going until you're moving everything inside this circle. And the idea is you're supposed to think that that is this, right? There's some complicated series of seven brains that's been piled up in the interior. Um, and you can put them all, if you like, at the origin, and then there's just a brain configuration that, that has gone like this and been bent in around it with, with the various uh, branch cuts going like this. Um, this is just suggestive. I'm not claiming this is a proof anyway, but it would suggest that this diagram is indeed corresponds to the same physics as that one. And therefore for n equals three, which of course is three times one, multiple of three, there's no brain at the origin. Uh, so our conjecture was that therefore you'd have to see SU3 times D6, and actually you see more. This is true, you see E8, but certainly you see SU3 times E6, that's, that's inside of E8. Okay, so, so for Owen's question, let's do N equals four, and N equals four, of course, is not 3K. So this is the origin here. Um, and there are five brains there. And again, this diagram has been uh, color coded so that the ones of the same color get identified under the rotation. And so you get this uh, like fish on the right hand side. And here, this is the origin, and it touches the five brains. Okay. And then, so you have this peculiar, peculiar fish diagram. Um, and again, you want to see if you can compare it to something in the known literature. So you start with an E5 web, it turns out. 
which looks like this. And again, you do the Hanane with moves to bring all the seven brains inside. Uh, so they're, they're, they're detailed here. At the end of the day, you get this curious fellow here, and you're supposed to think, ah, that's my fish, right? It's got the two arms and the fin and uh, a bunch of seven brains uh, inside, which is hopefully this, except of course the seven brains here are right at the tip, but perhaps that doesn't matter. And then again, that would suggest indeed that for n equals four, we would conjecture that it's sun times su3. So that's su4 times su3. This diagram suggests that actually it enhances, you actually get e5. Uh, as a bonus, because this, these n equals three and n equals four are not generic, they're special. This pattern that we're talking about, I don't think we're gonna see enhancements in uh, exceptional groups for arbitrary large n. Okay, so that's sort of some of the intuition behind what we were doing. Um, so let me mention some tests. So one of the things to do is to construct the uh, cyborg written curve for these five degree theory. Um, so one thing that I've sort of brushed under the rug, and now, now I want to uh, talk about again, is the following. So we have this orbifold, and if you think of it in terms of an S-duality action, you have this M, remember M was over here. This is the monogamy of the, of this, of the seven brain. It's just some SL2R, SL2Z trans, SL2 transformation in the S-duality group. And what it does is it takes a D brain, an NS5 brain into a uh, minus minus one, minus one, minus one brain, and then it repeats its order three. Uh, so that's what the S duality is doing for you. But one of the key things we're saying is, well, you have to map, marry that, if you like, with a rotation in space time. But one thing you could note if you're, the first thing you might object to if you, if you do brain diagrams is that yeah, a five brain, a D5 brain, an S5 brain, and one one brain, and stuff like that. And only this is 90 degrees, and these are whatever, 135 or something. And so you can't rotate them. They don't have this rotational symmetry. But actually, the other thing you have is the, the tau, the complex, uh, you know, the, the axial diloton there. Um, that'll also get uh, changed under the action of M. So you need to look for a fixed point. So you need to say that tau is invariant under this s transformation. And so it turns out that tau cubed is one, and this is the solution uh, for tau. So you're at this point, you're at this strongly coupled point in type 2b. Um, and furthermore, there's an axial diloton, axion, sorry, and that changes the rules about how brains intersect. So actually, you were wrong to draw this. I was wrong, not you, so I'm not going to fault. I was wrong to draw this diagram because actually when you're at this point, they all look more like a honeycomb lattice, like my uh, roof in uh, Cairo. Um, so when you're at this point, they do indeed all intersect at, well, uh, 120 degrees. So to that end, it's helpful to use slightly different coordinates from the usual ones. So. I introduce S, which is a linear combination of X5 and X6, and T is just X6. And then you can write the metric in the five, six plane uh, in this way. Okay, that's a bit of notation. So to construct the cyborg witten curve, we need to compactify one of the spatial directions of the, the gauge theory. So X4, and we're gonna call that S sub T, and T dualized to type two A along X4, S sub T, and then lifts M theory on another direction that pops up in the strong coupling limit of M theory. So that's T sub T. So we have another torus, which is parameterized by S sub T and T sub T. Uh, and we define uh, these new complex coordinates, S tilde and T tilde, okay? And if, if you're interested, uh, you might introduce Z1 and Z2, another combination of S tilde and T tilde. And then you see that uh, this uh, complex structure is invariant under the, the T 
is the Z3 transformation, excuse me. And the metric, the natural metric, which you'd write like that, well, when you restrict to just the SCT plane, that reproduces this metric up here. So in these coordinates, you're just back to a very simple situation. Okay? And, and therefore, by the way, it's clear that this action is super slow. The action, the Z3 action. Okay, so if you map what happens to the Z3, um, then it's rather simple, just S tilde goes to minus T tilde, and T tilde goes to S tilde minus T tilde. But again, as classic from uh, the sort of five brain side of Britain curves, S and T tilde are not single valued because their imaginary parts are periodic. So you exponentiate them to X and Y, and then we have simply this action. Uh, this is the Z3 action on X and Y. So if you want to construct the cyber Britain curve, um, it's going to be some kind of polynomial constructed out of X and Y. It's going to be degree N, um, but you need it to be invariant under Z3, under this, under this action here. So how do you do that? Well, one thing is to observe, there's a particular class of uh, monomials with combinations of monomials, sigma ij. So you take your n and i and j with a, i plus j less than n, uh, and then you can construct the following object, sigma ij, which is just this combination uh, of, of coordinates. And then it turns out that under the Z3 action, it's not invariant, but it's the next best thing. It just rescales by some overall factor, which is the same for all of them. So in other words, it can preserve f to zero. And so if you want to build, you build your f's out of sigmas. Yeah? Uh, and that's going to give you a class of uh, polynomials that are invariant under the Z3 action and of degree n. Okay. So it's quite clear from that that f is, is just an nth order polynomial and it describes a smooth curve generically. Uh, and the Euler number, well, of course, is 2 minus 2g, where the genus is this famous formula for uh, Euler number of a, of a polynomial of degree n. The, sorry, the genus of polynomial of degree n. And of course, that's an agreement with g being the rank, sorry, little g being the rank of big G for the tn theory. But if, indeed, that's not surprising because at this stage, we're really just describing the TN theory. We haven't actually done the orlefold. Uh, we're just looking for points in the moduli space where you could do the orlefold. So this is just a restriction of the TN side of the theory uh, to, this, uh, to a Z3 symmetric point. Okay. You've just thrown out a bunch of moduli and you're stuck to a certain subplane inside the full space of the TN theory side of the theory. Now we want to do the open form. Uh, and then you have to worry a bit because there are Z3 fixed points. And there are these three points. Remember tau is, well, it's e to the two pi i over three. Um, and here again, you, you see the difference between n equals three k and n, n not equal to three k. So for n equals three k, sigma is never vanishing at these points. Uh, but for n not equal to 3k, it vanishes on these two points. So therefore, uh, when you do the overfold, for n equals 3k, you're fine. You're not going to have any problem. And so the Euler number of the overfold curve is just one third uh, the Euler number of the original. But for the n not equal to 3k, there are going to be two fixed points, and they will contribute to the Euler number in addition. So you get one third plus two times two. Uh, and then if you whack in these formula that we have here, uh, you will reproduce the formula uh, <clears throat> for uh, chi that we, that we, and the rank of the g that, that we had about. So that's a test, this conjecture. Um, another test we looked at is uh, to construct C3 mod delta as a singular hypersurface. So, uh, 
To do that, we introduce four coordinates, which are invariant under the Z3. And then you find the one relation between them, which is this thing here. And then you, you make the identification that the overfold is for the spectrum of, 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 of formal variable C modded out by this relation. Um, now for n not equal to three K, uh, you can look for where the singularities of that curve are. And uh, they occur, on, so they could have mentioned two, they're lines. Uh, so these, these guys that we call D0 is always there. Uh, and then there's one at this guy D1, which is this one particular surface line. So. And then if you look at the classic classification of singularities, you can read off that this guy is an SUN singularity and this guy is an SU3 singularity. On the other hand, for n equals 3k, uh, the, the singularities are wrong again here, but actually you find three other ones, not just one, because this fact that you have the tau and tau cubes is, is one. And so if this guy is the same as that guy, he gives you an SUN, uh, but these guys give you three SU3s, the three of them. Um, but then there's one more little miracle, which is for n equals 3k, uh, this hypersurface is written here, um, f equals zero, it becomes, uh, uh, what's it called, homogeneous equation. And so you actually you get something sitting in weighted projective space uh, with the weights like this. Uh, and then we argue in the paper, look, I didn't bother to put uh, anything on transparencies here for it, uh, but you can argue further that this indeed represents a further enhancement of SU2 cubed into E6. So that is again consistent uh, with what we were claiming on the left. Okay. So I think I've actually sped up or didn't play any slides. So here are on my comments already. So just to summarize what we did, uh, we discussed how this non abelian delta 3n squared class of C3 overfolds uh, can be interpreted as a particular gauging of a Z3 symmetry of the toric calorie R. So on the toric side, it's just, you, you pick a Z3 symmetric resolution, and then that allows you to overfold out by Z3. But in the PQ5 brain web, it corresponds to going to a particular point of uh, moduli, so in particular tau must be e to the two pi i over three, where the brain web diagram will therefore have Z3 symmetry, which looks like rotations. So you can do this rotation along with S duality transformations uh, to identify the brains. Uh, we argued that the intuition behind that is that you introduce a seven brain at the origin. And the seven brain at the origin is a very specific one. It's going to have a monogamy of E6, um, which is what you get from the particular element of the S duality uh, transformation that, that keeps cubes to one. Uh, and that's responsible for an extra flavor symmetry that appears in the diagram. But there are two special cases because if n is equal to 3k, um, then there's no brain at the origin and we, we think the story just survives and, 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 and you're just basically doing a simple overfolding of the theory, um, but it enhances uh, to an E6 uh, symmetry group. But if uh, n is not 3k, then there will be brains that are intersected at that singularity. We think that meant that the E6 is uh, broken. Uh, it's broken down to SU3. So you, you get a, uh, an, an increased uh, flavor symmetry, uh, but it's not E6, it's just uh, SUN times SU3. Um, and again, I want to mention it, it worked uh, of these other authors that's come out since, and that's of interest. And um, they're all, what, what, what? This paper and this paper, uh, no, sorry, the first two papers, they're all involved in looking at more general cases of these non abelian subgroups of SU3. Uh, like I said, there's a list of uh, some 12 classes of, of, of such orbifolds. And Ito and Reed give you a prescription by this age function in those cases. Of, of what data you can read off from the gauge theory. 
And uh, these authors are more focused uh, on the sort of thing that I was discussing here, where you take a brain work diagram, you go to a point where it has some kind of rotational symmetry, and then you mod out by that symmetry, add the seven brain in, uh, and uh, see what kind of low energy gauge theory uh, you get. Uh, and so I want to thank you. I'm sorry, well, perhaps you're happy to be ending early. And I just uh, thank you and I show you the full scene. <laughs> Mm. Wow. So let's uh, thank Neil. <laughs> Maybe take just a moment to appreciate this uh, amazing picture. But no, of course, uh, ask questions. Uh, oh, hi. Hi, Neil. Yeah, yeah. I just have a question about the T4. Uh, so using the brain web approach. So, so in fact, if you take the global symmetry as you four times as you three from the naive like readoff of the quadrimensional singularity and the problem is as you four times as you three cannot be embedded into a e5 which is so 10 so so how do you resolve this in the brain web picture so geometrically we have a kind of argument but i just wonder right you're going to the e plus four case yeah, the T4 case. So, so the, the issue is, is just that from the Lie algebra, uh, the SO4 times SO3 cannot be embedded in the SO10. The SO10? Yeah, 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 the E5, yeah. Oh. Um, yeah, I guess it's possible that. The, the, I mean, it's possible then. So we only actually claim that you get SU4 times SU3. And this diagram here, we uh, we argued that it looks very much like something with E5, but actually I don't know if we even tested it we've got the full E5. So that maybe the claim that it goes to E5 is not correct. Uh, I'd have to think about that. Well, if it's actually around point E5, then the global symmetry should be there should be some way to enhance it to SO10, and that's a full global symmetry. Um, mm -hmm. so, so geometrically, we kind of, you know, we argue that SO, SO4 is somehow broken to SO2 squared times U1. And, and if you embed a smaller group into the SO10, then that's okay. Mm -hmm. But I just wonder like whether you have uh, something to say about in the brain web picture. No, actually, it's the first time you've made me aware of this point that it doesn't uh, embed nicely. Mm. Um, so, in in general, when, when since there were now a few works um, on um, this topic, so you mentioned, for example, also Kim Kim Lee and of course uh, Hinan's work, w were there any differences in the results you get? Um, because so so it, because the the, um, the idea is is always the same. I would say you take some brain web or eat some geometry, however, and then you you gauge some discrete symmetry. But now, what is meant by gauging a discrete symmetry? It seems to me that this is not the not always the same thing that's what's meant mm -hmm. by it. So my understanding is yep. quite large. So I should, uh, well, the main one would be the Kim Kim Lee one because I, that, that that's many more classes. So we've only really focused on this one simple delta three m squared. Now I do think there was some controversy about whether or not uh, they think that we should get e six versus s u three in one case. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are different choices because there are, we choose it's all in the details. Where is it? Um, for example, we choose this monotony. Yeah. Where is it? Oh. We chose this monotony, but there's another one that satisfies M cubed is the identity. And it's associated just to SU3. So this one is SU, if you look at the old papers, this one gives you an E6 paper from cubed. There's another one that's cubed that squares to one and gives you E6. So there's a two choices. If you oh, like. and these are not related by SL to Z. No. I don't know. Uh -huh. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, I see. I see. I don't mm -hmm. know. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So there, there are some controversy about the T four case, 
although both in our paper and Neil's paper, uh, the conclusion are, are kind of the same because they are both the rank one E5 theory. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, uh, is it required that they have to, that the uh, yeah. uh, no. three embeds into E5 at all? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah there's a, a global symmetry issue. Like, so, so, so for the E5 SO10, I mean, if you just write down the affine thinking diagram for E5 and see how, how does the non abelian subgroup are embedded, then you can, you can embed as you four times as you two squared, but not mm -hmm. as you four times as you three. Yeah. So from the field theory perspective, could there be some way in which you can two, do uh, two Z3 gaugings that give different results? Is this a yeah, positive? Yeah, I think so. yeah, 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 maybe. Uh, yeah, it's not super, uh, you know, it's not, not super proven that this brain web uh, the construction and the geometry give rise to exactly the same thing. It's, it's still conjecture, I guess. Okay. And I think it actually addresses perhaps uh, Oren's problem. I mean, I don't know which one of these really have a field theory interpretation. But... Mm. So apparently, apparently, oh, no, if, I mean, if for theory... me, he is also field theory. So I don't need to be a gauge theory. So you mean, sorry? So I, it doesn't need that doesn't need to be a gauge theory uh, interpretation. I'm also yes. happy if it's just an SCFT in 5D and it has some global yeah. symmetry in them. Yeah. yeah. So people have computed all of these discrete global symmetries now and. Now, if you say you gauge a uh, uh, subgroup, could there still be two ways of doing this? This is my question. That would lead to the two uh, brain web interpretations. Yeah. But I, yeah, I don't know. What happens if you start with uh, a brain web with a Z2 symmetry or a Z4 symmetry? Like the simplest thing you can think of is a, a, a uniform SUN quiver. Mm. Just SUN times SUN yeah. times SUN with N flavors at the ends. That has a Z2 symmetry and it could have a Z, it has a Z4 symmetry if the number of nodes is equal to the rank mm -hmm. to N. And then so you can have a Z2 or a Z4. Is it known what uh, what gauging those gives? So certainly the Kim Kim uh, Lee paper does has some Z4 examples. I, see. Okay. I don't know if these are Z2, it's funny. <laughs> it kind of tells you take a linear quiver and, and swap it. Yeah, yeah, they also got some different results for the just a T4 mod Z3, but I think they're just using a different way of gauging. So they say that the T4 mod Z3 is also rank one EH theory, but I think it's just some different, they're just some different in the gauging process. Mm -hmm. So both are both the T3 mod Z3 and T4 mod Z3 are both. Yeah, yeah, that's what they said. Yeah. <laughs> So all of these gaugings, they involve gauging uh, R symmetry as well, right? It's uh, it's it's not only the, um, standard global symmetries, but also you have to mix it with R symmetries. Yeah, I suppose you would, yeah. And so maybe it's in this interaction mm. between the gauge, the global symmetry and the R symmetry, there are subtle differences that give these different results, right? Mm -hmm. Because wait, 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 how do you how do you gauge this? R symmetry, sorry, like well, the discrete, discrete part. Well, I don't know. Is it is it really? So, are you saying that you're you're gauging just a glo uh, part of the global symmetry, uh, a Z three symmetry? Mean, it's not clear actually that you have to gauge the R symmetry. No. What? Why is the R symmetry involved? Yeah. Why? The R symmetry should remain SU two. You shouldn't do yeah, it. So yeah, I take it. Yeah, but is, isn't there an, uh, in the gauging? So can can you write the gauging purely in terms of um, of five D field theory data? What do you mean? You mean the, the, the Lagrangian description? Yes, no. there's no Lagrangian description that in, that has uh, SUN cube global. Yeah, yeah. The yes. Z three is in the auto automorphism. Yeah, it has to be yeah, yeah. And there is no Lagrangian description that has that. Yeah, I don't think there's a Lagrangian way to do this at all. 
I guess there might be some Z2 gauging that you can do that preserve the the gauge description when you have like the, the thing. Uh, for the uniform U S U one curve, so, then you yeah, the thing that you were mentioning, then you could have some Z2 that mm -hmm. preserve, but otherwise, yeah. certainly for Z3 or Z4, you would always right. mix yeah. the. Yeah. This is clear. But... But then I'm there's sorry. one way of doing the Z3 gauging. If it's just exchanging the three SUN symmetries of the SCFT points, then there is a unique way of doing it. It seems like it. So that's why we're thinking it, one of them at least should involve something else because otherwise there is an inconsistency. Mm. Pietro, you were going to say something. Yeah. yeah, I wanted to ask you uh, to ask something. I mean, thank you for the talk. Um, I wanted to ask a clarification. So is the statement, so you understand the statement in terms of uh, putting brains at, at, at singularities that are orbifold singularities, like C3 mod gamma. And uh, are you saying that necessarily the resulting theory will have a symmetry? So is there a Z3 symmetry in the CFT? So uh, yes, there would be, a, well, it's a special point. So you have to go to a special point in a smart device space. It's not, you know, so generically, like if you go to the, to the, the, the here. So in, in general, the CFT uh, will have various sectors and you could, for example, do various resolutions which, which are not Z3 symmetric, yeah? So, mm -hmm. so you have to go to a very specific point in a very specific resolution. So that would be a very specific combination of your parameters on the, of the SCS, SC, SCFD, and then you can do it. Sorry, when I resolve, I'm on the Coulomb branch, no? Yes, yeah, you're on the Coulomb branch, but you have to do it. So I'm not in the CFD area. now. Uh, I, I, believe, I agree that on the Coulomb branch, I have, a, I have a bunch of symmetry that they don't have with the CFT. No, so I don't think the CFT itself has a, has a generically has a CF, as a Z3. Ah, okay, 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 okay. Okay. Um, okay. No, but the SCFT should also have the Z3, no? So what do you mean by generically? I mean, super yeah, yeah, no, I'm wondering what I'm meaning to. It's a well-defined, yeah. yeah. There are no marginal deformations. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, it could be. It's just. It's just a permutation of the of the of the three SU threes. Yeah. yeah. And also, sorry, and I know. So sorry. The spectrum of operators. They all. You know. They all come in. You know. And yeah, take it back. Yeah, they will have a Z three. Must be. Some of them three. will be permuted, and some of them will go to themselves. Yeah. yeah. No, it must have a Z three. Sorry, but that's an automorphism of the symmetry yeah. group. So it's not a symmetry itself. It's an outer automorphism of the I symmetry group. Those are usually are not considered symmetries, no? Am I confused? Hey, what, sorry, can you explain more? What? So every, all the operators will come in Z3 multiples or something like that. Yeah, but for instance, you don't say that the R symmetry is SU2 times Z2. You just say it's SU2. Even mm -hmm. though there is an outer automorphism, there is Z2. Whereas in the geometry, I understand, I, yeah. I mean, I still don't understand, it's like an S fold in 4D, right? It's something that you do in the geometry, but it doesn't act on local operators in the field. Yeah, but well, I have to think about that, but it's not, it's not clear to me at what level one has to, where you have to impose the symmetry. So here it's all been done through M theory. So, yes. and, we can, and we can see that in M theory, I can do all of these, I believe I can do all the moves that I have described um, and therefore come up with a system, which is the one I've got at the end of the symmetry. Now it's true, if I would, if, well, certainly I have no idea what will happen if I were to try to come up with a Lagrangian description, how I would do all of these moves. What, yeah, I, I, think, I think Pietro is right. I, I don't think this is the symmetry. I don't think you're gauging some global symmetry of the superconformal theory. Yeah. It's I think it's, you're just constructing a new superconformal field theory by doing something in the geometry, so. Uh, okay. Okay, this is a very good point. I, perhaps in the geometry, you, it's, you can think of it as a global symmetry in the geometry, like in the PQ web, it's some combination of uh, 
a rotation in space and some SL2Z transformation that yes. contributes to the D5 brain and the NS5 brain and whatnot. And so then you're, you're gauging it in the, some sense in the, in the string theory. Yeah. But from yes. the point of view of the field theory, you're just construct. I think you're just constructing a new supercomputer. So then also, it's similar to uh, Douglas Moore before. No, you don't say that uh, the orbifold, the C2 mod Z2 or whatever. Yeah, I mean, the, the inequality the CFTs, theory, right. they, they are not gauging of an equal four. They're just right. uh, taking a subsector in a, yeah. Okay, thanks. That's right. That's right. Do, we have, uh, do we have more questions for, for Neil more specifically? Because <laughs> if not, then I would say, let's, uh, let's thank him again. Okay. And uh, I'll stop the recording and we can, of course, still discuss.